All right, everyone, let's get this party started. Welcome, class, to Classics 160D2, Classical Mythology, and today's lecture 14.1 uh, on mythology and sports in the ancient world. So what we are doing this week uh, is we're going to take kind of a thematic approach to mythology, right? So far, uh, we looked at gods, we looked at goddesses, we looked at heroes, we looked at heroines, we looked at mythology in the Roman world. And so now we're going to look at how it intersects with a couple different uh, other aspects of society. Today, we're going to look at myth uh, and sports. Wednesday, we're going to look at the intersection of mythology in the modern world. And then Friday, we're going to turn our eyes towards some of the projects that you guys are putting together. So let's see what we got on the docket. We're going to start with announcements and a brief recap. Um, then we're going to move into the origin of sport and kind of think about what actually, start thinking about that now. Like, what actually are sports? Like, how would you define what a sport is? And if that does seem incredibly obvious to you, start thinking about how you would differentiate it from like similar, but like kind of sort of maybe different things. So like what, for example, is the difference between uh, sports and athletics or sports and a game, right? Um, or sports and a competition, right? All words that are related to each other, but maybe not exactly the same thing there. So start thinking about that. Then we're going to look at evidence for sports in the very, very early ancient Aegean, right? So from, uh, from the Bronze Age, right, like Minoan uh, Crete and Mycenaean Greece, and even far before that, what is our evidence for the very earliest sports? And then we're going to move in um, to a Homeric sport, the Olympics, uh, and then we'll see that something like the Olympics wasn't just limited to the site of Olympia. We actually have spots all over the Greek world that brought together athletes from different city-states to compete uh, in these kind of, um, well, they were both like religious uh, and athletic competitions. So announcements, what we got today, go ahead and put this thing in speaker view. You know the drill. Hopefully by now you can see me, you can see the words. If you have questions, email or message your TAs and they will write you back wonderful, wonderful responses. Um, in terms of moving forward, here's what we're looking at, right? This Friday, your project is due. You've already done all the research. The research is done. All you're doing at this point is translating all this great work you've done from a written form, which you turned in a few weeks ago, to something that's engaging in digital. Right. Uh, so it could be a movie, uh, a music video, a podcast, a graphic novel, something along those lines. All right. That's going to be due Friday at class time. And then here is the opportunity. If you guys want a little bit of extra credit, we've got an opportunity for nine people. First come, first served to present their work on Friday. So Friday's class is going to be a presentation from some of you guys about what you've done for your project. Nobody has to present, right? You don't have to do it. You can just sit back and watch and enjoy if you'd like. But if you want five extra credit points, go to D2L. There's a Google Sheet there. Uh, and go ahead and um, input uh, your name. There are nine slots available. If you want to, and the nine slots are already full, just put them in the little slots below that. Um, please don't write over people's names. That's not a nice thing to do. <laughs> don't like go erase their name and put yourself in slot three if there's one already there. Again, you don't have to do it. It's not a huge amount of extra credit, but it's always super fun uh, to see what you guys uh, have produced. So that's the plan for Friday. Okay, so here's what we're looking at. Um, is Friday just going to be presentations? Yes, Friday is just going to be presentations. And I think, yes, we're still doing attendance. So there might be a uh, Heracles showing up somewhere in the middle of the, the presentations. Um, but it's good. It's good for you to go support your colleagues and your peers and see the wonderful work that they've done. So what we're looking at today, a lecture on mythology and sports. Wednesday, mythology in the modern world. Friday, student presentations. Again, a totally volunteer basis. Monday is our review session. Wednesday uh, is the exam itself. And then Thursday is... Uh, another Thanksgiving, right? Kind of a Thanksgiving that your professor does not have a final exam during the final exam week. Uh, and that like 
at that point next Wednesday, your kind of commitments in, uh, to the class should be totally done and you can go focus on all the other exams that you've got. Okay, did I miss something? Did I have something else in there? No, no, I guess not. Okay, cool. Um, so here's what we are recapping, right? Last week we talked about Roman mythology um, and uh, what we saw is that frequently it's thought of as just derivative, but in large part, it's not totally derivative, right? It's a, a combination of different influences, uh, both from Greek culture as well as from Etruscan culture. Uh, real quick here, I got one question in terms of the exam next week. The exam is just during class time, right? You don't have to show up on Zoom. It's on D2L from 11 to 12 or 11 to 1150 uh, on next Wednesday. So instead of showing up to Zoom, you just click on D2L, start your quiz, and you're going to be good to go there. Oh, 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 one other thing, one other thing. Go back, go back. One other thing, one other thing. Okay, so uh, I know I've been promising you for a long time the uh, list of essay questions. Yes, yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, and so that will happen. It has not happened. I was busy not paying attention to this class over Thanksgiving break. Um, I know, don't, I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings, but I, you know, we all need a little break sometimes, right? And so TAs, uh, go ahead and by Wednesday's class, but by 10 a.m. on Wednesday, all right, go ahead and uh, each of you put together two possible um, essay questions that somehow link the first and second half of the course, right? It doesn't have to like perfectly do so, but the essay is gonna draw on both halves. The multiple choice will just be the second half of the course. I will add my own essays and then one out of the 12 will actually show up on the test itself. Uh, there's only one essay this time. Yeah, were there two essays last time? There's, yeah, one essay, one essay, one essay. Um, and the sign-up sheet should be, oh, the sign-up sheet for presentations should be on D2L uh, under this week. If you go to content and then you go to week 14 or module 14 and then you go to Monday or Friday, one of the days this week, the, the sign-up sheet is there. It's there somewhere, you know, go for it. Uh, okay, another question about the test. Is the test on the second half or are there gonna be questions on the first half? So essay question is gonna cover both halves of the class, right? Multiple choice questions, just the second half of the class. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right, how long will we have to present? Uh, you will have, no. oh, that's a good question. No more than five minutes. So the presentation, um, you know, if you've put together like a feature length film, about the gods of the ancient world, right? That is awesome. And me and your TAs, we are gonna sit down and diligently watch that together and eat some popcorn, not together, but you know, socially distanced on Zoom. And, uh, but for the presentation, you're gonna have about, we'll say three-ish minutes, all right? So if you put together something very robust, um, kind of like what I'd like the presentation to be is something along these lines, like, hi, my name's Dr. Rob. Uh, you know, I'm a, uh, an accounting major, and so I always, you know, I'm thinking about finances, and so I built a, uh, you know, a financial modeling system about the ancient Greek gods. I know that doesn't make any sense, but that's what I was interested in, and then I decided, hey, what better way to, uh, to do that than put together, like, some accounting software, like TurboTax. So I built this computer program, and I'm just going to show you a snippet today, right? Introduce yourself, a little bit about what your topic is, why you're doing it, what your format is, and then... I'll give you the ability to share your screen uh, and you can go ahead and show off a little of what you've done, right? So, hey, here's like a little snippet of my documentary. Even if it's 10 minutes long, show us two minutes and we're good to go there. Should we script what we're saying or just uh, present it like we're talking to our peers? Um, so for the presentation, right? Like for, for Friday, if you wanna present it, you're just gonna talk normally like this and then show what you've done. For the actual project, that's totally up to you, uh, whether you want to script it or not. I think a lot of it depends on what kind of, what you're going for. So when I've done this in the past, if you ever take one of my asynchronous classes um, on mythology or the, the Egypt class, I scripted all of those because I found, 
when you're talking like this, right, and it's kind of live and you're watching me live, I make lots of mistakes. I, re my, I repeat myself many times and it's totally normal. That's how normal people talk, right? Um, when you're doing like a movie or a recording and you make mistakes, it doesn't sound as good. I, it always very much frustrated me when I'd like repeat myself in a recording. And so as a result, I've scripted those things. So whether or not you want to script your, your movie or documentary, if you do something like that, totally up to you. Um, see what sounds best and go for it. All right, we got to move on and talk about this. What did we talk about? We talked about influences from Etruscans, from Greeks, all these wonderful people. We talked about the, the story of Romulus and Remus. Um, if you see a picture of this, you should know like how this fits into the story and know who these little tiny baby boys are uh, and their impact on the founding of Rome. Um, and then what we did is we talked through the seven kings of Rome, right? And we talked about how even though there's very, very unlikely that there are actually seven kings, the idea is that later Romans conceived of their early history as embodied by these seven kings, each of who contributed something to the character of the Roman people and the nature and kind of urban fabric of the Roman city. So we see the sixth king, right? For example, Servius Tullius, uh, the second to last king, you know, starting coinage within the city, as well as building the first wall around the city. So we still have the Servian wall, right? Running straight in uh, to the Roman train station. You can see the McDonald's uh, down below on the, you, you gotta go to the McDonald's on the second floor, right? So when you guys go to Rome, and also good news on that front, if you guys have been looking at booking tickets, apparently now if you fly through Atlanta or New York, you just gotta get a test before you go, and then you get a test when you land, and then you don't have to quarantine or anything, and you can fly to Italy, so you can go check out the McDonald's. Um, and uh, five points of extra credit for anybody who goes to the McDonald's and you know before the end of class uh, in Rome and, and takes a picture, selfie at the Servian Wall. Um, and yeah, so he built that, even though he didn't. Archaeologists think it was actually built like 200 years later. But we call it the Servian Wall because legend has it that it was built by Servius Tullius. All right, let's move on. So sports is our topic today. I love sports um, and uh, I love sports even more when they're in the ancient world. So our first question today, right, is essentially what, what even is a sport, right? And I'm gonna go through some evidence, some really early stuff that we've got, and you guys can kind of debate for yourselves whether what we're looking at actually is a sport or not. And one of the earliest things is this relief here, um, uh, this kind of Mesopotamian relief of boxers. And one of the things you wanna think about, right, is there is no text that like came with this, right? It's not like if you flip it over, there's like a text on the back that says, hey, this is a picture of two guys boxing. This is the first sport we ever invented in the world. So enjoy, right? It doesn't say that. All of our interpretation is just coming from the artifact itself. And so what you need to be able to do is look at this thing and think, right? What is it about this that conveys sport as opposed to something else, right? How do we know it's not just two people from opposite tribes or something trying to beat each other to death? And you look at it and you're like, oh, well, they're dressed similarly. They're not wearing armor. They've got their hands appear to be wrapped perhaps in something. And so that's the kind of uh, visual iconography interpretation that archaeologists do to make claims about what's going on in the early world. Okay, so boxing, one option dating to around 2000 BC, about 4,000 years ago. We also have archaeological evidence of lion hunts, right? So hunting is a big one. We get this in texts and in visual and iconography, both from the Near East and from Egypt. And so then you gotta think, is hunting a sport? I don't know, it depends on your definition. One of the things that we do learn here is that when it comes to hunting, even if it started out as like a wild hunt, pretty soon what kings end up doing is they build their own like, like hunting preserves, right? So they build like fences around the animals 
And then it's not like just the king. It's not like what you're looking at, right? Where the king goes out and all by himself fights a lion. It's like he's got tons of dudes backing him up. And there's, it's not particularly a, uh, a fair fight. So we've got early evidence of hunting. Um, in Egypt, we've got something uh, called the Hebsed Festival. And so what you're looking at right here is a relief of one of the pharaohs running this thing. And what the Hebsed is, is in very, very early Egypt, right? Um, one of the hypotheses that's been put out is that the king was actually ritually killed after a certain amount of time, after 30 years of rule. They would actually kill the king in order to ensure that whoever's ruling is like still strong and virile uh, and able to, to, to confidently and powerfully lead the country. This ensured that you didn't get somebody who was super old and uh, no longer very good at their job. Now, the thing is that kings realized pretty early on that that was a terrible aspect of the job. The fact that if you did a really good job and lived for 30 years, then you would get like killed. That was not very appealing. So they were like, hey, Let's start a festival, like a rejuvenation of power festival. And the way that this works is that there's markers set up around the palace complex, right? And the king gets dressed up and he holds this scepter and he runs around the complex twice. And he's running, and he's running, and he's running. And if he makes it around the complex twice, he is like rejuvenated for another three or four years. And then he's got to repeat this every three or four years, right? After the first 30. If he doesn't make it around the complex, then he is actually ritually killed. Um, and so a lot of uh, incentive to stay in shape and do a good job um, and some sort of kind of athletic performance, um, even if it's not something we'd really call sport. Right? So what we've looked at so far and what we're going to see is we've seen these things that kind of have aspects of what we'd consider sports, but maybe they're not totally sports. And that is similar when we move from the Near East and from Egypt into the ancient Greek world, right? Uh, so again, what we're looking at here, we are going to move down um, to Minoan Crete. And so again, when we think of the Greek world, we want to think of this whole thing over here. Uh, we've got Mycenaean cultures up in mainland Greece, uh, centered on Mycenae and Tyrans. Uh, and then we've got Minoan culture in the islands and in particular on Crete, with the Palace of Knossos being the biggest one in the middle of the island there. And you'll remember this perhaps from very, very early on, right? Uh, Minos is the, the son of Europa from Europa in the, the bull story um, with Zeus. And uh, then also Minos is the father of, well, kind of sort of the father of the Minotaur. I don't know, the adopted father of the Minotaur. Anyway, this is the site of the Minotaur in the labyrinth. And what we end up seeing is some evidence from sports here from the second millennium BC. So what we can see when we're looking at this here, right? We've got frescoes of children boxing, right? And we get that similar kind of imagery, wrapped hands, wearing the same thing. The fact that they're kids is probably indicative of the fact that they're not trying to kill each other. Um, but we don't have any written rules or anything like that. We can see other evidence um, over here of people wrestling, right? We see a lot of things going on uh, with bulls, something happening there. And... Uh, then we can take a, uh, a closer look as well of people fighting here, right? And then when we look down here, we see people doing some other sort of athletic event, right? So here it appears to be what's happening is that they're like, a bull is charging at them. They are jumping over it and like leaping off of the back of a bull somehow. And so it's some sort of bull leaping. And when you look at other places, from the Palace of Knossos, you can see a lot of imagery like this. So this is one of the most famous frescoes from the site. Once again, somebody leaping over the back of a bull. And then you can look at this in other sorts of artifacts as well, right? So we've got the bull right on. That's the, the drawing here. We've got this fresco here. We've got a little figurine of somebody leaping over a bull. We've got like a, a gold seal, right? Like a, a ring seal that you, you'd use for wax. Um, or clay, uh, that, somebody jumping over a bull there as well. So there's some sort of athletic feat going on where people are running and jumping over the back of those bulls in some performative way. Now the question is, right, like, 
is any of that sports, right? And uh, it really depends on what, on what and how you define it, right? Um, for instance, does sports have to be athletic? Does there have to be a competition? Do you have to compete against somebody else in order for it to be a sport? Um, does there have to be an audience or prizes? Uh, does there have to be some sort of um, way to differentiate winners and losers? Right? And these are all different things that people have put forward as different uh, characteristics of sports. And you can define it any way you want and through any combination of those, all of them, one of them, uh, or some combination of them. Now, when we get actual sports that like us in the Western world would like really very confidently identify as these are sports happening very similar to what goes on today, the first instance we have is the Homeric epics, all right? And so we've got Homer's Iliad, uh, in particular the Iliad, uh, to a lesser extent the Odyssey, where Homer ends up describing different things that really like have a lot of the characteristics of sports in the modern world. And to get a sense for how he describes these things, we have to understand kind of the way that you become a big deal in Homeric Greece, right? So the, the kind of goal is uh, to become an agathos, right? A good man, right? Somebody who's, who's good, not just in terms of like acting good, but like really like being a, a great person. And the way that you demonstrate that is through arete, right? And this is the word for like excellence or skill. And one way to get to, to kind of um, gain arete, right? Or to demonstrate your arete is through like warfare. But another way to do it is through success in athletic competitions. Now, some of the things that we end up getting from the Homeric epics, some of the stuff that we see here, uh, is that for the first time, we see sports specifically associated with prizes. And so when you go through these, you often see things like tripods being offered as prizes. So these started out as uh, cooking dishes, right? So there'd be some sort of fire underneath that would heat things up. You'd have your thing, your stew cooking in there and you'd eat it up real nice. Um, but later on, they also become just kind of decorative things, right? So, uh, so not just a functional cooking dish, which you might make out of ceramics, but something to put on display like this metal one here. Yeah, uh, other prizes we see, we see um, different uh, amphoras filled with like things like olive oil being given as prizes. And we see that later on too, when we look at the Panathenaic Festival and the Panathenaic Games, there it is very much uh, amphoras with a picture of Athena on one side and a picture of whatever the athletic event is on the other side, filled with high quality olive oil for the victor. So prizes, we get those for the first time. And where we see this most explicitly um, is in something known as the funeral games of Patroclus, right? So we see spectators here as well. There we go, I'll jump to that in a second. Yeah, so we get prizes for the first time, we get spectators for the first time, and where we see this most explicitly is in the funeral games of Patroclus, okay? Now, we've covered the story in uh, a little bit of depth, um, in this class so far. But again, the idea here is that Achilles, right, is sitting out the Trojan War because he's upset at Agamemnon for taking his lady. Uh, Patroclus is getting sick of seeing the Greeks being killed. He wants to go win glory and honor in warfare. So he takes Achilles' armor, goes out into battle, does really, really awesome, and then gets himself killed. And in his rage, then Achilles finally enters the battle, kills Hector. Uh, towards the end of the book. But one of the things that he does first is he holds a big set of funeral games for his deceased friend. So he throws, Achilles himself throws a set of athletic games in honor of his deceased friend. Now, there's a couple theories behind this. One is that like, uh, this is giving him proper funerary rights. Another one is that this is a way to basically make good with the uh, leaders of the, the, the different leaders of the Greek army as well, by letting them participate in the games and giving out prizes to them as victors in these games, he's actually repairing his relationship with them. Now, 
what are the events that are actually taking place here? So the first one is a set of chariot races, all right? So we see chariot racing happening, right? Where it's very explicitly a competition between people, where there's a prize for the winner, right? Where there's spectators watching. And what Achilles does is basically say, hey, I want the best from among you, right? So this isn't open to just anybody who wants to participate. This is like the greatest of the Greek athletes. They're the ones who get to participate. We also see a uh, boxing and wrestling, right? So two things that we get in the Olympics later on. These are other things that, uh, that Achilles has a competition for. Um, we see foot races, the very first event from the Olympics. So we get a race. We see a weight toss. This is one of my favorite ones where you throw a lump of iron, right? The cold competition is just who can throw the lump of iron the farthest. And then as a prize, you get to keep the lump of iron. Uh, so not the most creative thing ever, um, but that's one of the events for the funeral games of Patroclus. Uh, and then you also get uh, these combat sports as well. So you get combat in arms. So something like this, where you're fighting with armor uh, and spears, and the winner is the first person to draw blood from the other person. The goal is not to kill them, right? And in fact, when it comes to the funeral games of Patroclus, Achilles actually has to stop the fight because it gets too like intense, right? And he's like afraid somebody's gonna get killed. Um, there's also archery, spear throwing. And in this, right, what you can kind of see is that in addition to a lot of these things being you know, put on for diplomatic purposes, there's a lot here to suggest that sport is serving both as training for warfare, speed and strength and combat abilities, as well as uh, kind of a proxy for warfare, right? So when you're not fighting, when you're not at war with your neighbors or the Trojans, right, you're able to still win excellence, demonstrate arete, through your skill in sports. So you'll notice that a lot of these are gonna come back up in just a second when we talk about the earliest version of the Olympics. So the takeaway points there are that when we look at the ancient Greek world, um, the earliest sport is very much associated uh, both with mythology, right? The story of Achilles in the Iliad, as well as um, with the funerary realm, right? A celebration uh, at at one's death. All right, now, when we look at the ancient Olympics, right, the Olympics are named after the place where they took place, right? And that, of course, is Olympia. And Olympia is out here in the Western Peloponnese. The whole peninsula here is known as the Peloponnese. And it's out here, kind of, sort of, in the middle of nowhere. And this was known as one of the Panhellenic Games, meaning that city-states, independently governed, from all over the Greek world, would send their best athletes to Olympia to compete. And when we look at the site itself, what we end up seeing is it is also very, very closely tied to religion, to mythology, and to the gods. So you can see the center of the site here, right? We've got the massive temple to Zeus, the statue of which was one of the wonders of the ancient world. We've got the Pelopion, this monument to Pelops, we'll hear about him in a second, a temple to Hera, another altar to Zeus, the Metroon, all of these things are religious structures. And then you go through a little archway here and then you enter the stadium. Now, we've got the Pelopion here, right? Why do we call it that? Because of this dude Pelops that you guys have actually heard of earlier in the course. So Pelops is the second in line from the start of the House of Atreus. So Tantalus was the first. You guys remember Tantalus doing all kinds of terrible things to the gods? And then Pelops is his son. And Pelops, like, suffers quite a bit here. Uh, but eventually, he gets quite a place of honor. Uh, in terms of one of the myths, he becomes the founder of the Olympic Games. So you remember the story of Tantalus. Uh, and in that story, Pelops ends up chopped up, right? Tantalus chops up his son and tries to feed him to the gods. And the gods catch on. Mostly. Demeter eats a little bit of them because she was sad at the time. Uh, but the gods cast, uh, catch on, put them back together, um, and eventually he's taken up to Olympus. But then his lousy father, Tantalus, keeps messing with the gods to the point where they throw Pelops out, right? They, like, throw Pelops out of Olympus, and he has to go back down to regular 
Earth. And he goes over into the, the region of modern day Turkey, Anatolia. Okay, so he's in the, the, the region of Lydia or Phrygia, Western modern day Turkey. Um, and eventually he decides to head over to the site of Olympia. And there he falls in love with the daughter of like a nearby king, King Oinamaus, right? So he falls in love with Hippodamia, who's the daughter of one of the local kings. Now, the problem here is that King Oinamaus gets a prophecy that he's going to get killed by his son-in-law, right? So naturally, what he's going to try to do is at all costs prevent his son-in-law from existing, right? Like, don't let your daughter get married. But you can't just like prohibit your daughter from getting married. You have to do so in some very, very elaborate way. And so what he does is he sets up a chariot race, right? But he knows that his horses are gifts from Poseidon. So he's got these like magical horses and he's gonna win any of these chariot races. And anybody who comes to take the hand of his daughter in marriage, they have to go race him. And uh, uh, Oina Mouse always ends up winning. But Pelops is a big studly dude. And Hippodamia is in love with him big time. And so he's like, hey baby, like uh, maybe you can help a brother out here, you know? And she's like, all right, how about this? I will replace the pins in the wooden axles like with wax, right? The things that hold like the wheels together, I'm replacing those with wax. And what ends up happening is the, the chariot race starts, right? And Oya and a mouse goes out ahead, right? And he's got these Poseidon horses. And as he's going, right, the heat from the wheels builds up and up and up and up and up. And slowly that starts to melt the wax and eventually the wheels fall off and Oina Mouse is thrown from the chariot and he ends up dying. And so he is, like the prophecy comes true that he is uh, killed by his son-in-law. Now, to honor Oina Mouse, right, because he doesn't want to be seen as like the dude who killed his father-in-law, uh, and to purify his guilt, Pelops sets up the Olympic Games dedicating them, in nearby Olympia, dedicating them to Zeus. Okay, so that's the first version of the start of the Olympic Games, right? One of the myths associated with it. Another one of the myths is that it goes back to our main man, Heracles, right? And if we remember his different labors, the fifth one uh, was about the river um, diverting the rivers to clean the Algean stables. And before we get too far into that, let's go ahead and we'll do our attendance for today. Uh, Heracles is looking poipal, all right? So go ahead and go to quiz 36. What is today? It's November 30th. Choose poipal. Get your attendance points. Choosing poipal. And uh, we will pick up again in a minute. Mm. And today's class is brought to you by Safeway Signature Select Seltzer Water. When you can't make it to Costco, it's the next best thing. Oh, it, yeah, if purple's not an option, just choose purple. That That's probably the correct answer. Yes, pur purple will be okay. Although, it should be purple. You gotta choose purple. <laughs> All right, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so, 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 we remember our main man, Heracles, looking all purple, and his fifth labor was to clean the Algean stables. Now, there are 3,000 oxen, and it hasn't been cleaned in 30 years, and they're crapping everywhere, and it's poisonous crap, and it's bad, right? The situation's bad, it's not good, it's bad. And uh, what Heracles does, with the inspiration of Athena, right, is diverts the local river to clean out all that crap, 
and then must thus move on with his labors. We find out later that actually throws a whole kink in the plans, but there you go. Uh, now, to thank the gods, he clears the grove nearby this river, all right? Uh, and what he ends up doing is then marking off 600 feet, back to back to back to back, all right? Uh, and so just one foot in front of the other, uh, and that becomes the distance of the original sprint race at Olympia, right? This is known as the Stade. The race is known as the Stade. It takes place in a stadion, which is where we get our word stadium, and that is based on the length of Heracles' feet. Now, the other thing he does is he plants a sacred olive grove, and what we're going to see is that this becomes the olive wreath becomes the prize for victors at Olympia. And he ends up dedicating the whole thing uh, to his dad, Zeus. In my opinion, it would have been like kind of cool if maybe he dedicated a little bit to Athena because she was the one who helped him out with the labor, but he doesn't, he dedicates it all to Zeus. And so we see once again, very early on, with the, the, the origin of these games, we're seeing a distinct link um, and connection to both religion and mythology. Now, one of the cool things is that in addition to these kind of mythological stories, we also have like historical evidence of actual victors at the games in the form of these victor lists. Um, and so what they do is they like have long lists of like people who won different events going all the way back to the earliest times. And that's one of the ways people calculate when these things actually started. And it turns out the first guy to win was this guy, Coroibos of Ellis. Ellis is one of the nearby city states. Um, and he was like a like a, a, a farmer and a baker. And he won the first Olympics, which was just one single event, just a foot race. That was it. And this baker dude won. And I kind of like that. I like the idea that like the Olympics, I mean, they're cool. I, the Olympics are awesome, no doubt. But it would be awesome if they just got regular people to compete in the events. Like, oh, like Bill the Accountant, right? Like, here, you're now going to compete in boxing. And, um, like, I don't, yeah, like, something like that. I think it would make for a very interesting uh, set of games. Going back to Coroibos of Ellis. And when we look, right, again, at the site itself, we've got all these religious things here. And then finally, the stadium over here to the, to the east. Okay, now, one of the largest things at the site is this Temple of Zeus, and this became incredibly popular in antiquity. You can still go there today, you can see the ruins of the temple. It's not in great shape, uh, but in antiquity it was a really big deal, and you can get a sense for what it looked like, right? We gotta always imagine these things are brightly painted as well. And then on the inside, we actually have one of the wonders of the ancient world, the Statue of Zeus. Uh, at Olympia became known far and wide as one of the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, like the statue of Athena, it was one of these Chris Elephantine statues where it's covered in both gold and in ivory. Now, one of the cool things, oh, do, I, do I have a picture? No. One of the cool things is um, just outside of this, like right over here at the site, uh, maybe it's right, I think maybe it's this thing right here. Um, what the, oh, hold on, no, no, no. Wait, 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 one second, one second. I know, where is this thing? Oh, other side, other side, over here. Okay, so uh, this is known as the workshop of Phidias. What we actually have is we have the workshop of the dude, the architect who built the statue, uh, which is awesome. And they've excavated this workshop and they've actually got the molds for like different parts of this statue that became one of the wonders of the ancient world. So they've got like molds where like, you know, they, they would put the, the kind of clay in between the, or they would make clay molds, uh, and then they would model different parts of the statue uh, based on that. So really cool. Um, and then also the workshop itself is built to the exact same scale of the inner sanctuary at the temple, um, with the idea is that the architect could actually visualize how the statue would look inside the building, um, because the thing, the building was built to the exact same specifications. Very cool stuff. All right, then we've got the Stadion. Now, except for chariot racing, all the different events in the ancient Olympics take place in the Stadion. And this is what it looks like today when you go to Greece. And in antiquity, 
it wouldn't have looked much different, right? This is kind of surprising in the sense it's like, it's so, so plain, you know? There's like not, not much there. But this is what like Greek stadiums were like. When you see big ancient stadiums with stone blocks everywhere, that's Rome and the Roman period going in and putting an infrastructure in on top of it. Uh, but this was more or less what it's like. So you would have had a statue over here, you would have the judges in this little box right over here, you've got the marble start line, and there would have been a little post that you'd have to turn around at over here, but that's more or less it. Spectators sit on the grassy banks and you've got the original stadion. Then you can go there today, and if you go there, you can still run races exactly where Coroiba Savellius would have been doing it almost 3,000 years ago. When you won, you got, like I mentioned, right, these olive wreaths going back to the myth of Heracles planting the olive grove in honor of his dad, Zeus. Um, and this is one of the uh, major characteristics of these Panhellenic games, that you're not getting things that are really worth money as a prize. When you win the Athenian games, you get stuff that's worth money, right? All that olive oil in the vase. Here it's just a wreath. And we'll see also with the other sets of games, you get wreaths of different types of plants. Now, the events themselves, uh, they, they evolve over time. So when we read those victor lists, what we find out is that the very first one was just a sprint. It's just the stade. Um, and it's about 200 meters, it's about a 200 meter sprint. And then over time, different versions of that get built up. And so you have the out and back that shows up next. And then you've got the long race, right? The Dolichos, you've got the Hoplita Dromos, which is the armored race, right? So you actually do your running in like full armor, like 60 pounds of armor. Um, but these are all things that evolve over the course of time. You've got the pentathlon, that's one of the original Olympic events. And what it does is it com combines your finish in the running and wrestling events, right? You don't do those again, it's just however you finished there. With three pentathlon specific events. So you've got the javelin, a javelin which you see here, you've got the discus, and you've got the broad jump. And when you do the broad jump, you actually hold these things known as halteres. And what you do is you leap out with these things being held out in front of you. And then when you kind of get midair, you throw those behind you, right? And by throwing them behind you and releasing them, that actually propels you uh, forward even further. Then you've got the combat sports, right? So we saw these a little bit uh, with the, the funeral games of Patroclus as well. So you've got wrestling, you've got boxing, then you've got Pankration, which is like the MMA of the ancient world. So this is like the anything goes one. The only two rules are no biting and no eye gouging, right? So anything else, and you can think about the range of other things you could do to a person, it's not pretty. But those are the two rules, no biting, no eye gouging, ancient MMA, the Pankration. And then you've got the equestrian sports, right? Both the four horse chariot race, the two horse chariot race, um, as well as an actual horse race, right? Mounted horse race itself. And it is kind of like kickboxing, the Pankration, um, but, but also more like mis mixed martial arts in the sense that you could kickbox, you could do just more normal boxing, um, you could do wrestling as well. Um, any of those work in the Pankration. Uh, one of the characteristics, of course, is they're nude, right? One of the interesting things is they don't start out that way. We don't, it's, it's like the first 50 years of the game, there's no evidence of uh, nudity at the games. And then later on, it becomes a thing. And people have debated why that is. So some people argue uh, that it's a sign to show that you're not like cheating in any way, right? Uh, other people argue that it's like a sign of uh, kind of displaying the male body and the beauty of the body. Um, other people argue that it's like you were just faster when you were not wearing anything at all, rather than trying to run down the, the stadion in a toga or something like that. There would have, of course, been spectators, right? Uh, but they would have just lined the grassy banks here in the ancient Greek world. If you fast forwarded to Roman times, Romans are the ones who would have put in like marble seats and benches and things like that. Okay, now to conclude, one of the, idea here is, uh, one of the ideas here is that this was simply uh, one of four different sets of Panhellenic games. And again, when I say Panhellenic games, I mean people coming from all over the Greek world to participate. Now that contrasts with things like civic games, right? So we talked about the Panathenaic Festival. 
and we talked about the religious components of that, sports would have been a component as well, but that's based on a particular city. The Panhellenic ones bring together people from everywhere. And we can see the, uh, the, the sites here. Um, so the Olympic Games here at Olympia, but we also have other ones. Uh, we also have the Pythian Games from the site of Delphi up here. And you guys should know enough of the story, right? That like the reason they're called the Pythian Games is because that's where Apollo hunted down the python, right? Slaying the python, it slivers down into the, the, the cracks of the earth. And then above that, he builds the Temple of Apollo. And then there's a set of athletic games associated with that. And if you march today, right, you go up the, the site, up the slopes of Mount Parnassus, at the very, very top uh, of the sanctuary, there's actually a stadium that you can see the Romans have built their, their stone seating um, and just absolutely incredible views. Uh, from the top uh, of Delphi, where the, the athletic contests would have taken place. And for this one, uh, you get a laurel wreath crown associated with the god Apollo. We've also got the Isthmian Games. So Isthmia is right next to the major city of Corinth, right here. And this is a big deal because, well, we get the word Isthmus uh, from this, where it connects Attica, where Athens is, to the Peloponnese and the Argo lid down here. Um, so a very, very strategic site. And as a site right next to the water like that, right, it is no surprise dedicated to Poseidon. So we've got one set of games for Zeus, one for Apollo. We've got this set of games associated with Poseidon. And originally you received a, uh, a wreath of dried celery. And later on uh, that became a wreath of pine for, uh, for winning those games. And then you've got one final set of games uh, for Zeus as well. So at Nemea, right here, a little bit southwest of Corinth, you of course know Nemea already from being the site where Heracles accomplished his first labor, right? Slaying the Nemean lion. But there's one other um, set of Panhellenic games where people come from all over the Greek world to participate. Uh, and this one is also dedicated uh, to Zeus. All right, so some of the differences, right? When we look at the modern Olympics, it starts out not at Olympia at all, right? The modern ones don't go back to Olympia. They're started in Greece, but in Athens. Uh, and then a number of things, right? Like the, the rings, the interlocking rings, that's a completely modern symbol. The idea that you get uh, medals as prizes is completely modern, right? In antiquity, it would have been the wreaths themselves. Things like the, the torch uh, carrying um, from Olympia to the, wherever the games start, that's a completely modern thing. So you can see kind of a list of similarities, right? The four-year cycle, although it's kind of two years now. The oath, the peaceful assembly, some of the events are the same, the idea of competition. But you can see quite a few differences as well between antiquity, uh, where it's held, the lack of ball sports in antiquity, no water sports, um, uh, no weight classes, women ga women's games weren't a thing. Um, there weren't any like second or th like silver or bronze medals or anything like that. You either won or you lost in antiquity, um, that sort of thing. So quite a few differences as well. So the idea here was just to give you kind of a run through uh, of one of my favorite things, which is sports and how it connects the mythology of the ancient Greek world. Uh, Keep working on your projects. Start finishing those things up. If you're interested in presenting, go ahead and put your name on that list. For, uh, Wednesday, we're going to talk about linkages between ancient mythology and the modern world. Um, and so have a wonderful couple days, and I will see you guys then, all right? Have a great one.